I think we'll give just a two minutes or so. See if we get a couple more people here on Zoom, and then we can get started. The hair is gone. So okay. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Carl, did you have any announcements or introductions? Well, the only announcement would be the uh, competition in a couple of weeks. We're at, uh, recycling something from a couple of years ago, doing the three Bs, benches, barns, and bridges. Um, I'm expecting to see a whole bunch of good images and hopefully not a lot of that one barn in the Tetons that everybody likes to go and shoot. <laughs> hopefully we get some variety. You get some different stuff showing off. That'd be nice. The let's see. Uh, we do have a, a guest here on Zoom, Arjun. If you would, sir, uh, would you let us know um, how you found us, uh, what type of photography you do, uh, what you might expect to get out of a, a photo club, etc. We'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you all for having me. My name is Arjun. I'm new to the Denver area. Moved here for my uh, medical residency and uh, honestly just found your club on the internet. I was looking for a photography club to join because hoping to have a nice artistic outlet when I get back from the hospital and you were one of the first ones to pop up. Your website seemed real interesting and just thought I'd check it out and see what you were about. I'd have to say though, it seems like y'all are all quite professionals and I am quite an amateur. I don't even have my own camera yet. So we're not professional. You've been taking pictures for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say something similar. We all started out in the same place that you are. It's just that some of us have a few more years under the belt. That's all. Yeah. Well, you know, that's great to hear. I was just kind of hoping to find a club where I can uh, meet like-minded people and hope to learn the craft and uh, just have some fun shooting around what a beautiful city we have here. So thanks for having me. Where are you from? Well, I'm from uh, California near uh, Sacramento. Great. Well, welcome. Yeah. Hope you, you find, the, yeah, hope you find this evening's uh, program entertaining and yeah, inspirational. Yeah, and uh, and do, do know that uh, when you do join the club, um, we do have uh, – mentors. Uh, we have people, you know, experienced photographers here that uh, you can connect with. And, you know, we have uh, a photo shoot that will be going on in the end of August that you're more than welcome to come to. All that information will be on the website and stuff. Wonderful. Glad you're, glad you. you're here. And uh, um, besides this meeting, I will also send you an invitation to the next meeting to our competition. So you, you get a feel for what the presentations are like and what the competition are like for us. Amazing. Appreciate it. Awesome. Great. Thank you. I don't have anything else. David, do uh, you have anything to uh, talk to the folks about? I'm, so, I'm sorry, what was that? Do you have anything to talk to the folks about? Or um, I think just the, 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 Mount, the Metro outing at the end of August, August 30th. Yeah. Um, and Gwen will be circulating in the newsletter and I think by email probably um, information about that. Um, and as part of that, if you don't mind my putting in a plug, yeah. Gwen, there's a uh, calendar contest in the city of Littleton uh, where submissions are due September 15th, which is after two weeks after the, the uh, outing. So nice. um, uh, you know, folks should, should feel free to enter that. And I don't know if anyone's interested, but the Arapahoe County Fair is also uh, looking for submissions. I believe early the early submission deadline is July 19th. And then the fair is actually the 27th to 31st. So if you're interested, go to ArapahoCountyFair.com and uh, um, they have information about submissions and so on. Colorado uh, Renaissance Fair, same thing. Okay, right Colorado, Colorado Renaissance yeah, Fair has their competition. Weekends and you can submit for that. Yeah, I put, I put something in the uh, newsletter about the, the Renaissance Festival. It's always a fun place to go. There's some interesting people there. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. If we have nothing else, then uh, I will ask everybody on Zoom to please mute so that uh, we don't interrupt uh, Oz in this presentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we're ready to go. Okay. I'll introduce Oz briefly here. Um, 
The third time's the charm. Um, Oz finally made it to Antarctica on his third attempt in the uh, post-COVID period. Uh, but he went uh, by ship uh, to the Antarctic Peninsula um, for a three-week photographic journey last December and January, um, including visits to the Falkland Islands, which some of us may remember from the, the war, the brief war, uh, the South Georgia Island and the South Orkney Islands. Um, they went ashore at, many, at, at these places in 10-person inflatable zodiacs, uh, bouncing around on the waves, I'm sure. Um, and uh, Oz learned a lot about photographing birds in flight, and hopefully he'll share some examples of that in his uh, photos today, and the various species of penguins on the shore, as well as the challenges of shooting in a saltwater, a cold saltwater environment. Um, we've already seen in some of the competitions some of his iceberg pictures, but I'm sure he's going to uh, treat us to some more of those and their wonderful shapes and, and colors. Um, and then uh, also pictures of whales, whaling stations, and um, he, he learned a lot about the present day danger of bird flus, bird flu to the birds of the Antarctica. Um, so Oz has many years, um, and uh, you know he's a mentor and, and uh, and a great photographer. So uh, without further ado, Oz, let me pass it over to you. And uh... we tried three times and the third time was a charm. So we uh, flew from Denver to Miami down to Buenos Aires, spent a couple of days there, and then uh, flew down to Ushuaia, where we got on the ship. So this is a map of our journey. So we flew into Ushuaia. Uh, we went to Falkland Islands, over to South Georgia Island, over to the South Orkney Islands, and then to Antarctica itself, the Antarctic Peninsula. This island here with a cursor, that's called Elephant Island. And uh, that's where Shackleton ended up. And he eventually went over to South Georgia Island, that's 800 miles, but we'll talk about that later. First picture, we're, we're here in Buenos Aires and ready to take off for Ushuaia. And this is shortly before landing in Ushuaia. All over this area are mountains. Uh, this is the Beagle Channel in the foreground. This is aerial view of Ushuaia. Mountains in the background, uh, timberlines about a thousand feet or so. We're at about 54 degrees south, which is equivalent to in the northern hemisphere to Prince Rupert in BC. So we were, this is the main business district in Ishwaya. Uh, notice all the trash there. Turns out that. On that day, when we arrived, Argentina beat France in the World Cup championship, and they celebrated, and that's why the trash is all over there. The next day, everything was clear, clean, and it was nice. So, But they, they had a good time celebrating. So we spent a day there, uh, walked along the shore, and these are lupins growing wild. They're the cultivated type. Uh, so we saw a number of birds. This is a steamer duck. Don't find that in North America. This is a juvenile black crown night heron, which you also find in Denver. This bird here um, found something to eat. And this is a great southern petrel, giant southern petrel. So he grabbed onto this piece of whatever it is, not too pleasant. He couldn't swallow the whole thing, so he grabbed onto a piece and then lurched backwards to rip off a piece. Um, so a picture like this, you want to do a pretty fast shutter speed to stop the action, uh, at least a thousandth of a second or so. Did you, uh, did you take more than one picture, or is this a... A burst of pictures? No, um, I don't do bursts. Uh, I might do two or three, uh, but but this was not a burst. And I'm using a 70 to 300 millimeter on a crop sensor. So it's equivalent to 
Well, the longest lens or longest focal length is about uh, 450 millimeters. So this is a kelp gull. So what I do is I get the camera to uh, track the bird. Once it gets uh, focus on the bird, then it can track no matter where the bird is in the, in the viewfinder. So continuous focus and tracking. So I use that a lot for, well, that's how I did the bird pictures in flight. These gulls with the brown heads, they're actually called brown-headed gulls, an original name. So the blue and white ship is our ship, the Ocean Diamond. It's about 400 feet long, draws 16 feet of water. Uh, we're 165 paying passengers. And from, from the ship, we'd go out in Zodiacs to shore. So we have arrived on board, just my wife, Gail, and they, showed, they gave us some refreshments as we came on board. So we've left, the, we've left Ushuaia now. I'm traveling along the Beagle Channel to the east, where we're going to head to the Falkland Islands. So this is uh, with telephoto, just the hillsides, mountain sides as they recede uh, as silhouettes. And looking back towards Ushuaia down the Beagle Channel, there was a French ship returning to Ushuaia that had gone to Antarctica. And so <clears throat> going to the Falkland Islands is a, a good day and a half cruise on the ocean. So I took pictures of well, this is a detailed picture of the ship, one of the exhaust, <clears throat> the exhaust pipes. And then the next evening, we had all kinds of, several hundreds of albatross and petrels, giant petrels following our ship. They came there because we had crossed paths with a fishing vessel. And these birds had been following the fishing vessel, hoping to be fed. Um, they didn't get anything, so when they saw our ship, they all came over to our ship and cruised around behind our ship. A bunch of us got pictures. Um, they didn't get fed, and pretty soon they disappeared. So these birds are pelagic birds. They spend most of their lives at sea. They only go to shore for nesting, raising young. This is a black-browed albatross from that group that we just saw. All right, so yeah, about a day and a half later, we arrived at the Falkland Islands and there were three places we stopped at. So there are TVs throughout the ship and they, they display the map of where we are at present. So this is the map of, of the Falkland Islands. We stopped at number two and three then went over to number four, which is Stanley, the capital of the Falkland Islands. So here we are, we've arrived, the ship anchors offshore, and we traveled to the shore in these Zodiacs, 10 people to a Zodiac plus the driver. Uh, you can see the Zodiac in the front and one at the stern of the ship. As you can see, it's pretty windy, uh, quite a bit of chop. So getting from the ship to the shore uh, without getting your camera full of salt water, we had a, um, a dry bag. And that's how we transported camera equipment to shore. Uh, sometimes we would be cruising in the Zodiacs along the shore and we could take pictures and I'd have a plastic bag that I'd have ready in case we had spray. And um, then I could protect my camera with the plastic bag, uh, making sure the opening was facing down. So here we are on shore now. Um, one of the few flowering plants that we saw. And a little off to the center, there's also a bug on one of the flowers. This is just a pattern shot. Uh, leaves, leaves of this plant very close to the ground. Most of the plants that we saw on this trip were. Uh, not tall at all, very, very, very short. So just a pattern shot. And this is just to show you what the island looks like, uh, very rocky. 
not much growing there. If it grows there, it's quite short. Uh, in the foreground, there's a Magellanic penguin, maybe a nesting site. And kind of in the middle is another colony, and those are Gentoo penguins. So these are the first two types of penguins we saw. Uh, overall, we saw seven different kinds of penguins. Um, all, the, all the penguins that we could see. There was one, one more type that we didn't see. The tussock grass here is quite tall. And in the center, there are two dark areas. And the penguins have gone in there and made their nesting, nesting sites inside there, raising the young in there. This close-up of a Magellanic penguin. I uh, don't know if that's sitting on a nest or just sitting there in a hole, but up close. These are upland geese. The females are the brownish, darker ones, and the males are the white ones. So females are much more camouflaged. Picture of one of the geese feathers. We got to the other shore, we crossed the island on foot, and these are Magellanic penguins on shore, islands off, rocky islands offshore. Just gives you an overall idea of what it looks like there. And these are also steamer ducks, but these are flightless steamer ducks uh, found only on the Falkland Islands. When these ducks are very, very young, they're much lighter and they can fly a bit, but as they get older, they put on weight and they can't fly. So this is what it looks like uh, with our group on shore photographing the penguins. Now, bird flu is a problem. Hasn't reached these islands nor Antarctica yet. So we were restricted as to what we could do. Uh, the, and the rules are quite new. We were not allowed to put anything down on the ground. We couldn't kneel down, couldn't put a hand down. So if you wanted to take a picture from eye level of the penguin, you had to squat down. So that wasn't very comfortable and hard to get up without touching the ground. So I didn't squat down very often. Anyway, we're, we're close to the penguins. The penguins ignore us. These are Gentoo penguins. They've been out uh, looking for fish or krill or whatever they eat and coming to shore. And I was lucky enough to get this one in, in flight. Uh, they don't really fly. They just use their wings to fly underwater. And here are these, these same penguins are now on shore, walking up the beach. These are the Magellanic penguins that have come out of the surf, uh, coming back from feeding. And three penguins here, uh, they were on the beach and walking down slowly. In this particular picture, I didn't have enough uh, space on the left side. Penguin on the left was too close to the edge. So with content to where I filled in some extra space, so that uh, that penguin wasn't too close to the edge. And this is a, an oyster catcher. We have a very similar species on the East Coast, but this is a species just from this area here. If you look closely, it's carrying something in its beak. So we went back across the island, got on the ship, and this is our second landing. There's a dock here. Uh, usually we just, uh, the zodiacs would go up nose up onto the beach and we'd step off into the water. But here we use the, the dock. This was the only place we saw trees once we left Ushuaia. These trees have been planted and in amongst the trees is a house and a couple lives there year round. There's a windmill that provides electricity for them. They have a few solar panels and just enough electricity to get by wonderful vegetable garden and flower garden. And we, our destination was up this hill, across the island, about a mile and a half away to a colony. And this is just the landscape as we're going there. So you see nothing tall, uh, quite rocky. This is a detail showing the moss and the lichens, uh, small plants, like the patterns in the Lichen and mosses here. 
So this is what we were looking for. Our destination it is a nesting colony of the white-browed albatross. And in amongst there are also the rockhopper penguins. You don't see them so easily, but they're there and you'll see them in subsequent pictures. So the penguins are nesting here as well. And to get food, they have to walk all the way down to the ocean, swim out, find something to eat, and then climb back up and bring the food to the young. So that's not too easy. Here's a rock hopper penguin sitting on a nest, probably incubating an egg. More an overview of a mixture of penguins and white broad, white browed albatross. And this is one of these penguins standing up. Notice the feet are kind of light pink color. Depending on the species of penguin, the feet will be different shades of pink or black. Um, you'll notice the, the differences as we go along. This is a close-up of one of the black proud albatross. We could get very close to these animals, birds. They didn't care that we were there at all. We're not a threat. We're not considered a, a predator. If you look at the beak of the albatross, there's a little hole towards the back of the beak. And these albatross, are also the birds that are always at sea, have to drink salt water. So behind the beak is some sort of a gland that acts like a kidney and it takes salt out of the water and they can therefore survive on the salt water. And this is a baby albatross being protected by one of the parents. Uh, both, the, both parents will uh, incubate the egg and take care of the young. So we lay, we are going back now. We're at the house of, of the couple that's living there. So as I said, they have a nice garden. These are yellow lupin. And when you take pictures of flowers, it's really nice to have a dark background that doesn't distract from the main subject, in this case, the lupin. So when you take pictures of flowers, look for something like that. This is an austral thrush. Looks a lot like a robin. A robin in North America is also a thrush. So these definitely are related species. And this is similar to our pine siskin. As we go, as we leave the Falkland Islands, we see very few of these small birds. And the further south you go, the fewer species of birds you get. And that's true as you leave the equator and go south or north, the number of species decreases by the time you get to the poles or the Arctic regions, there are very few species. This is a different kind of goose. It's quite elegant looking. So this is a display, computer display, showing our location. Uh, the red line is where we've been. The yellow line is where we're going to be. And the red dot is our present location. Uh, we could go to these uh, TVs that show the computer anytime we wanted and see what our location was. The numbers in this picture indicate the depth of the water in meters. And I think the, the blue is probably more shallow water than the white. So this is Stanley, a population of about 2,800 people. We went ashore here, uh, spent a few hours in the town, and we also had the option to go to place called Gypsy Cove by bus. And we did that. And this is taken from Gypsy Cove in the foreground, almost center. You can see one of the Magellanic penguins. Uh, the orangish flowers are gorse, which are very spiny. They're kind of like a scotch broom, but you don't want to try and go through their terrible stuff. And a detailed picture of the some of the plants growing here. Again, very short, uh, close to the ground. They look a little look like succulents, but they're not succulents. And this is um, a view looking towards the sun, reflecting off the water. Some people think there might be too much sky, but I think it adds a lot to this photograph. So it's taken a pretty good telephoto. So from the Falkland Islands, we headed East, southeast, actually southeast, 
and we had open water for a couple of days. So one thing to do was to photograph these pelagic birds, birds that are mostly at sea. This is called a slender-billed prion, uh, much smaller than the albatross. So you get your camera to try and lock focus on the bird as it's further away and hope that it comes closer. And then when, when it's in a good place and you still have focus, if you have focus, then take the picture. Uh, these were very fast moving birds, very difficult to photograph. So this is the wandering albatross, the largest albatross in the world. And these would be in the area of our boat. Um, you'd see them most of the time, it's about a 10 foot wingspan. Yeah, the largest albatross. This bird is quite light colored. So if you let the camera expose for the general scene, then your bird will be, the whites will be blown out. So it's best to take a few test pictures and adjust the, I, I use the plus minus on the camera to uh, change the, the exposure. So I did that and then I got the proper exposure for the white and whatever happens to the water happens. So this is an immature albatross, wandering albatross, 10 foot wingspan really shows here. And there was a, a bird in the distance and I figured it was gonna come pretty close. And I got my camera ready and there it was. <laughs> so this is a, I think it's called an M400 military transport built by the uh, Airbus group. And it flew out of Stanley. We were fairly close to Stanley here. And I thought they might do a flyby. This happened to me when I was in Alaska on um, one of the ships there and the Coast Guard did a flyby. So the same thing happened here. So I took several pictures and this is, well, this is the one I chose to show you. Okay, so we're back to the map again. We're between Stanley and South Georgia Island, and there's something called Shag Rocks. It's about 120 miles from South Georgia Island. It's out in nowhere. And this is the extent of the Shag Rocks. Uh, they're just sitting there in the middle of the ocean. They're unusual. So the captain did a slow 360 turn around the rock so we could see them from all directions and take pictures. There are little dots on the rocks. Those are shags. And you probably know them by the name of cormorants. So shag and cormorant are the same birds. On the upper right are some of the cormorants flying. This is a more telephoto lens of that same rock on the right. And you're wondering what these Cormorants look like. This was when flying by the ship. There's a blue ring of, the, the blue is not feathers, it's tissue. And also in, at the front of the head, just behind the beak is some yellow tissue. But this is what they look like. They're a pretty nice looking bird. So if you want something maybe for competition that's a little more interesting, do a close up, uh, the rocks, run from upper left to bottom right. And then the nests run kind of in a, an irregular line from bottom left to upper right. So it makes a more interesting picture. The white is due to the, the guano that the birds do. So this is a map of South Georgia Island. We stopped in several different places. So number six through 12. Number six is called Hokum Bay. And that's where Shackleton took his largest lifeboat covered with canvas and rigged with a mast and a sail. He sailed from Elephant Island to here in the equivalent of our November in, in, in the winter, beginning of winter. 800 miles across the open ocean. How we survived, it's just an incredible voyage. 
If you want to read more, there's a book called Endurance by Alfred Lansing. I highly recommend that. And our first stop was number six there. Well, when, okay, on one. Um, here we're coming into Huckam Bay. This is very typical of South Georgia Island. Uh, glaciers, mountains, rocks, uh, it's quite forbidding. And when we arrived, the wind was blowing quite hard. But they decided conditions were just good enough to go out in the zodiacs. So they, they have a couple cranes here to launch the zodiacs. And they have enough zodiacs for all 165 people. So we arrived on shore here. On the foreground are the little black animals, our baby fur seals. And the more brown colored ones are the adults. So we're anchored offshore here. You can see a couple of zodiacs in the upper left. The green peninsula there on the right. There's a, actually a cave in there somewhere. And Shackleton and his men were in there. When, after they arrived here, they still needed to get to the other side of the island where there were people. So he left three of his men there, and he and two other men crossed over the mountains. Their map showed nothing, no detail on the map. So they didn't know what they were getting into. It took them 36 hours, and they arrived at a whaling station. Then the, the whalers came over here and rescued the three other people. So this is a replica of their lifeboat, 22 feet long, covered with canvas. Somebody had to be outside steering all the time. And they had, a, as I said, they had a mast and sail. He did get to a whaling station. Then the problem was he had to go back and organize a rescue of the people remaining. I don't know if I mentioned 28 people were on his expedition. After two attempts, he finally got this ship here and was this called the Uruguay and took this to. Elephant Island and rescued everybody. All of his people survived, which is just an incredible story. In the bay there, rocks and the orange colors is uh, due to lichen and grasses growing out of the lichen. I just like this as a, a detail shot. We're back on the ship, and this is another kind of albatross, a gray-headed albatross that uh, flew past our ship. Now, conditions were quite windy. Now, this is a Wilson's petrel, even a small bird, very small bird. I managed to get this picture. Um, this was the only one I succeeded at. So as we were leaving, very, very windy. And sometimes cold air comes down from the mountains and causes this very, very strong gust. They call it a willywa, and it'll take um, spray off the ocean and Lift it up, and that's what you see there in the picture. And as we were driving or moving in the ship, there were seals or sea lions in the ocean. So there's a picture of three of them. You can see here the weather was not good at all. Very, very cloudy, overcast, and extremely windy. We were on the ship or in the on the leeward side of the island, so the waves were small. It's, it's mainly just chop. So the ship wasn't rolling. And this is, these are the types of mountains that Shackleton had to deal with, the type of terrain. And the bird in the upper, upper left corner, a uh, long telephoto lens of mountains, very rugged land. So we've arrived now at um, St. Andrews Bay. We're at a colony of king penguins. A uh, ship offshore, we came in by Zodiac and walked over to this colony. So you can see the people from our ship. This is how we dressed. The, the yellow clothing was provided by the ship, although we had to, of course, pay for that. And we were required to have pants that were waterproof to go in the Zodiacs. They provided boots for us. And the boots, well, when we left the ship, we had to walk through a disinfectant solution and when we came back on the ship, they hosed off our 
boots with a high pressure water. And then we had to disinfect the boots again before we continued into the ship. And that's to try and keep the bird flu away from Antarctica. So far, it's okay, but I don't see how they can prevent that. If people, people visit here, eventually it's gonna come. Also, there are migratory birds from South America that come to Antarctica and they could be carriers. And if it, if it comes here, it would be disastrous for the penguins. So these penguins are quite spectacular. I was fascinated by them and took lots of pictures. As you can see, it was snowing here. Not too many times did we have snow. And the lowest temperatures we had were probably 28 degrees. When we were in Antarctica, it was much colder in Denver, so we really went to Antarctica to get, to get warm. I hear a couple of penguins uh, side by side. You can see the snow falling. So these are all penguins, the king penguins. The brown ones are young. They have this very good fluff that's a superb insulator. But when it gets wet, it's not good. When they have the brown fluff, they can't go in the water. So the adults feed them until they're just bags of fat. And then they have to wait, these, the young have to wait on shore until they get their adult plumage. So the bird on the left has almost shed all the, the baby fluff. And it's, it's almost an adult plumage now. While the, the young penguins are at this stage very fat, the adults leave them and go off into the ocean. So finding when the young are able to go to the ocean, they have to learn to feed themselves. Nobody teaches them. So they either learn or die. A close up of one of the young. If you look at the tongue, it's barbed and the barbs go backwards. So that helps the food from falling out of the mouth. Barbs all point in towards the, you know, towards the stomach. This is part of the colony. The young, I mean, the number of penguins, including young here, is estimated to be a half a million. So the birds in the foreground here, especially the one on the far left, looks like it has a white pouch. So it has an egg there that is incubating. The egg's on top of the feet and covered with a pouch to keep warm. Most of these penguins are um, incubating an egg that you can see that are facing us. Unfortunately, these eggs will hatch and the chicks will be fed for a while, but winter comes and these young are, are destined to die. They won't survive because of the winter. So the adults will abandon them and that, that's it for those young. Hopefully next year, they'll lay the egg at the proper time. But that's, that's just how it works. Another shot of the penguins. And this is how it was with people from the ship and the penguins. The penguins are very close to us. We're supposed to stay 15 feet away, but at times that wasn't even possible. We were confined to a path. And so we had to go to certain areas or we couldn't go to most areas. The crew from the ship would put stakes out on the ground and that was the path we had to take. All right, so, yeah, so Shackleton had gone from number six across the island to an area between seven and nine. So next we go to, well, we're going to go to Kritlikan, uh, which is the administrative center. And then we'll go to uh, seven, we've been to eight, and we'll go to nine, 10, and 11. Sorry, 10, 11, and 12. And we'll go down 12, which is a fjord, take the big ship there. So this is, this is Kritviken, which is, yeah, as I said, the administrative center. Uh, there are no other buildings, inhabited buildings on the island. There are fur seals in the foreground. In the, in, by night, sorry, by 1830, fur seals had been almost uh, wiped out completely. They were killed for their fur. They've since recovered and their numbers are back to what they were many, many years ago. Then whaling became important. 
uh, people needed oil for lamps and for lubricant. This was before oil um, from the ground. Whales were the only sort, well, were a major source of oil. In the old days, you're all familiar with Moby Dick and sailing vessels and the little vessels with oars that they would pursue the whales and harpoon them. By 1904, they had ships, steel ships that were fast. They had harpoons on them. The harpoons had an explosive, explosive head on them. So the whales didn't stand a chance. And this continued until 1923 when the factory ships were developed and the uh, whaling, whaling places on shore were no longer needed. But during the time, well, whaling continued on until the 60s. So during this time in the world, 3 million whales were killed. 2 million of those were in the Southern Hemisphere and most of these in the Antarctic area. I'm considering these islands, well, except for the Falklands, I'm considering these islands that we visited to be in the Antarctic area. So there are very large tanks here, and that's where they stored the oil. They would bring the whales on shore and take the blubber out, heat it, and that process made oil from the blubber. So looking in the other direction, uh, behind the white building, there's a fence, and that's a cemetery. And one of the people that's buried there is Shackleton. He died a few years after his expedition. When you take pictures like this, it's good to have a few people to add a little human interest. Okay, so we've got some fur seals here lying around. True seals have ears that protrude. Uh, sea lions don't have the ear, so... One in the middle, you can see an earlobe. Now that one's sitting on what looks like a rock, but it's really a vertebra from a whale. And just at the rear end of that seal sitting on the vertebra is the, is the hole where the spinal column went. So these whales are very, very large. So this is a, an old whaling vessel that's just rotting. They've run it up shore, on the shore, been there for many, many years, harpoon on the front. And then you can take pictures of detail, um, shots of rusting metal. Uh, this is part of a ship. The hole is where the anchor line came down. They get some nice abstract pictures. These are some of the tanks and machinery that was used for the whaling industry. I don't know exactly what they were used for, but it's part of the process of converting blubber to oil. And here's a detail of four of the tanks. So when you're around old things like that, it's fun to look for pattern shots or something like this. Um, there's lots of rusting metal equipment here. I like this one just as a pattern shot. Here's another neat pattern. These are probably nozzles of some sort, and I don't know what they were used for. The original was a black, was a, Kind of rust colored, and I thought the black and white was much more interesting. And there's uh, always peeling paint on rusting metal that can be very interesting. Well, this one you've seen in competition before, and I thought I'd also show the original just so you could see what, what can be done. So this is the original out of the camera. I, I removed the rivets, and I'll go back to the original, I mean, to the uh, Competition image. So that's the competition image. You can see the changes. And then back to the, out of the camera. And the next picture is, was taken in a similar place, a corrugated metal. This was also a competition image. And then I also have, this is the original one out of the camera. So you can see the difference between the two. So we'll go back to the original and back to the, Went out of, the, out of the camera. So we left Great Beacon and we landed another place. The weather is calm, not much wind at all. The seas are calm. So some people paid extra to go out in kayaks. So conditions were good, so they got to go out here. And the rest of us went in the zodiacs. They're 
moving the zodiacs around here. And what might what makes a nice picture too is to kind of have a curved path or curved line. So here's the, the curved path of the zodiac. I think this makes a much nicer picture than just a straight line. Picture of the mountains with the telephoto lens, very rugged mountains. Uh, fresh snow, probably from the night before. Little blue sky. So sometimes, well, there, there's a rule that you can't have more than 100 people on shore at a time. Some people would get to go to shore first and then do a Zodiac cruise. In this case, Gail and I went in a Zodiac first. We cruised along the shore looking at interesting things. It's somewhat difficult to take pictures under these conditions. Um, there's, there's not much wave action, so the camera's not going to get wet. But you've got people in front of you. The Zodiac is rocking back and forth. It's moving. Sometimes they'll stop and then you can stand up, but be careful you don't fall over into the water. There's seaweed on shore here, which is really neat, and it has long strands as the waves surge in and out, the water surges in and out. These strands just move backwards and forwards. It's really neat, but difficult to photograph. Um, here, the a little rain and a rainbow. And here, the pot of gold is the ship. Seagull happened to fly by. Now, when I went in the Zodiac, I usually just took one lens with my camera, so I didn't, wasn't changing lenses. It's uh, pretty hazardous. To, it's easy to get salt water inside the camera. So um, if I needed a wide angle lens, I used my cell phone, and this is a cell phone picture. Uh, the glacier up top, if it calves, big chunks of ice just come screaming down that mountainside. You don't want to be underneath there. So we landed here after we cruised around, and these are elephant seals, a big colony of elephant seals. Most, most of the big males are out in the water, away from shore. There's still some big ones here. In the background, you see two of them shoving, having a shoving match. One in the foreground here, you don't want to be too close. And then, well, I took this at probably at uh, 300 millimeters. And on this one, I cropped it even. It's the same, same animal. They can move surprisingly fast if they want to. And these two young ones, they've got their eyes closed, they're kind of sleeping, but they're still pushing each other a little bit and opening their mouths is threatening a little bit. Okay, this is another competition image that you saw a while ago. Um, people might be wondering what the original looked like. So that's the next picture. So this is what I started off with. In the fur towards the bottom, there are a lot of white grains of sand, which I had removed for the competition image. So we'll go back. This is what I entered in competition. Next one, this is what I had out of the camera. And there, there was a little baby seal here. I cropped this quite a bit. Just to zoom in, focus in on the head. And also here is another king penguin colony. In the foreground is a giant storm petrel sitting on the ground. These penguins, uh, every year they have to go through a molt in which they replace all their feathers with new feathers. This will probably take several weeks. And during this time, they, they can't go feed in the ocean. So they, they live off the fat of the land. So they'll lose some weight. Uh, this one's shed quite a bit of the, of the old feathers. Uh, detailed pictures of the feet of the king penguins. These kind of look like reptile feet. So everywhere on the beach were feathers like this. I didn't pick this out because this was a high concentration. This was typical. Many birds are shedding their feathers here. And unfortunately, not every penguin survives. Some of them do die. And there's scavenger animals here, which live off the flesh of these dead animals. This bird here, a snowy sheath bill, kind of looks like a chicken. It has a really unusual beak. It found these uh, stakes quite interesting. 
these are the stakes that our crew members put out so that we could follow and follow the path. Chickens tend not to fly very well, but these, these birds do. This is the same kind in flight. This is another place we're going for a zodiac cruise. And there's just a, a pattern shot with a reflection off the water. Not really choppy water, but slightly wavy. Hey, Oz, this is Carl. Um, is there yeah. a, a good spot here where we could take a pause, maybe take a five minute break? And I don't know how much more you have left. Yeah, um, that sounds like a good idea. But but if we could take five and people are going to get up and stretch and maybe, yeah. maybe chat, chat with you or whatever a little bit. But uh, yeah, th thanks for good. the interruption. I was hoping you'd do that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. All right. So everybody, uh, we'll take five minutes, get up and stretch, get a drink if you want, um, whatever you need to do. And we'll see you back in five minutes. Okay, boys and girls, if we could uh, take our places and uh, let's get back to the show here. The, <clears throat> the hillsides here are huge. And I had the zodiacs in here for um, kind of reference, see how, how small the people are. In South Georgia, there are two endemic species of birds. And this is one of them. This is the uh, South Georgia. South Georgia Pippet, shot from the Zodiac that we were cruising around. Uh, it's not easy to take pictures like this when, the, when you're in a boat and it's moving. So also, while we're in the Zodiac, this bird was flying towards us, uh, one of the giant storm petrels. So I got the camera to lock focus on the bird, and as I came closer, I shot a few pictures. Notice the uh, wing on the right side of the picture has just skimmed the water. And taken from the large ship, this is the same species of the bird, but it's the white phase of the giant storm petrel. It's not an albino. This is the Antarctic tern. If probably, you're probably familiar with the Arctic tern, which migrates from the North Polar region all the way to the South Polar region round trip once a year, the uh, longest migratory path of any bird in the world. The Arctic tern and the Antarctic tern look very similar. Uh, again, this was taken from the Zodiac as we're cruising around. And this is the other endemic bird, the South Georgia pintail. Excuse me, we have pintails in this area as well, but different species. Okay, still in the Zodiac. These Gen 2 penguins were marching down the, the beach, and you can see there's always one out of step. And in the background, the fur seals. The goal here was to see these penguins. These are different. Everybody knows the song Yankee Doodle. So Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat, and called it macaroni. So these Birds have a feather stuck in their hat and they're called macaroni penguins. So at least that's what we were told. This is a more another picture of more macaroni penguins. It's kind of fun to see the, the rocks and the fur seal here. I think it makes a more interesting picture. A couple of penguins that are pair bonding. Uh, telephoto lens. It's nice to have a fairly shallow depth of field where the background is blurred. This is the seaweed that grows here. It attaches at the tide line. We're used to the kelp beds in California, which attached way underwater and float to the surface. But here they hatch at the edge of the tide line and long strands go into the water. Oh, we went amongst these tall cliffs in the almost center a little, little bit to the right of the ship of the Zodiac. It's one single tall black spire. It was a huge, very, very impressive when we went by. Okay, so back on the Ocean Diamond, the big ship, and we're now at the Golski Fjord. Uh, took this with a wide angle lens. 
and I stopped it down to probably F22 to try and get the star shape of the sun. Now, fortunately, the sun was scared a bit with a cloud, otherwise it would have been way too contrasty. The ship went down the fjord here, full of photo shots of the mountains, very rugged mountains, uh, glaciers, ice, rocks everywhere. And on an ice floe here, a leopard seal. We only saw a couple of these. And the leopard seals uh, really like to eat penguins. Another view of the rugged mountains next to the fjord. And fresh snow, beautiful sky with some clouds. And this bird is a snow petrel. What I like to see, show here is clean aerodynamics. The landing gear, the feet are hidden in the feathers. Uh, very clean feathers on the wings. Just, to me, it's amazing. Or at the end of the fjord here, and I had my telephone on, and stepped in case we saw something happening. And here, the arch started to collapse, so I just shot a picture. Um, somebody was in the foreground, but I took that out in Photoshop and shot a series of pictures here. That whole arch collapses, and the next picture, it's gone. That was a big, big arch. All right, so now we're at the tip, southern, southeastern tip of South Georgia, and we were going to go to Elephant Island, which is just above, well, there's, in the middle of the picture, it says King George Island. If you look above the G, there's an island. That's Elephant Island. We were going to go there, but the weather was not good. so we had an open slot at South Orkney Islands. Um, there are probably 30 ships in this area cruising around and you have to make a reservation at these landing sites. Um, we rarely saw another ship. Uh, so each trip will be different depending on what slots are open and what the weather is. And uh, the, the schedule will change depending on conditions. It says Arctic Circle and Weddell Sea. That's where there's a lot of sea ice, very thick ice floating on the on the water, and that's where the icebergs originate. So the floating sea ice is flat on top, and these are um, icebergs originating from the Weddell Sea. So we're cruising here on the the big ship, we came upon this very unusual iceberg. It was so unusual, the captain did a 360 around this iceberg, went around very slowly. Um, it's probably as big as the ship. And here's a detail shot. Very unusual to have this dark color. Um, another portion of the same iceberg, when, when you take pictures where water comes up, onto land or rocks or, or ice in this case, it's best to take the picture as the water is receding and leaving lines behind. Otherwise, you just have a, an area of white foam. This isn't as interesting. And the next picture is a detail of that same part that we saw in the previous picture. So the, the um, big ship went past a number of icebergs and there were wonderful patterns. So I looked for these smooth shapes, uh, angles, sculpt sculpted shapes. Anyway, you can find all kinds of different shapes. Um, this one, I showed the black and white in competition last time. Um, increased the contrast a huge amount here. So it really stands out. And other people take pictures too. Uh, some people use their iPads, some use cell phones, but there were a lot of other fancy cameras. There a lot of money of, in expensive equipment here on the ship. So still from the large ship, well, a very large iceberg. I'm probably on level six, and this iceberg is even higher than we are. And it's, there's, there's a crack, so at some point that's going to fall off. But time to go to shore. Um, we're going to visit another penguin colony here. So this is how we 
got to shore, uh, just the bow onto the beach, you step into the water and go on shore. So the Delhi penguin colony here, and we've got uh, rocks that are colored with uh, lichen, gives the orange and reddish color. It was usually above freezing, maybe as high as 40 degrees. And the lowest temperature was probably 28 degrees. So really pretty mild. So here a detail of the lichen on the granite type rocks. So this is an Adeli penguin coming towards us. When they are marching along, they have their flippers out, I think for balance, like we sometimes put our arms out for balance. The best pictures are when they when, when the camera is at the same level as the penguin, uh, this turned out to be easy here because I was standing and the uh, penguin was above me. So that worked out well. Now these penguins have nests. The only material are rocks for making the nests. So they gather rocks from nearby or they'll steal them from another penguin. So well, here we have a penguin incubating an egg, and the nest is a bunch of pebbles. In the background is a chick, a real fluffy chick, full of fat. And it's so warm here, the penguin is overheating, and he's lying on the ground trying to keep cool. Now this Adelie penguin is probably has laid the egg too late, and it's not going. The chick's not going to survive. So this is a, an adult feeding a chick and all the fluffy ones are little babies. And again, when the, when the penguins are fat enough, the adults leave them and they're on their own to learn how to fend for themselves. A detail of one of the chicks, you can see the roof of the mouth also has prongs sticking out, pointing backwards as well as on the tongue. So these are two penguins. I showed this in competition earlier. And these are uh, two adults that have just met and they're pair bonding again. One's come to feed the young. And uh, yeah, they're just greeting each other. So we're heading back to the Zodiac and near the Zodiac is a Waddell seal. Uh, not, not concerned by our presence. So here we are. Um, very typical scene for us down there. A little bit of chop on the water. So as I mentioned, I would use a plastic bag when we were just cruising slowly to protect the camera or just have the camera out. Sometimes we'd be far from the ship and we'd have to go fast to get to the ship. And in conditions like this where it's a little choppy, we'd get some spray. So I'd quickly put my camera in the bag and keep my hand on it and Keep the bag sealed with the other hand. So as we were cruising around, we came to this iceberg and there's a single penguin on it and managed to get this shot. And I think it's quite nice. The, the big ice on the left and the single small penguin on the right. So this is a detail of a very small piece of ice next to an iceberg. You can see the uneven, well, the scalped uh, surface that's, that comes out about as it melts, uh, kind of a pattern, melting pattern. This is actually taken with my 70 to 300, shooting out of the Zodiac as we're driving by. And this arch had melted shortly before we were there. Um, I cleaned it up a bit with Photoshop, and that's what I got. So this is all one iceberg. Uh, the background is part of the same iceberg. And the bottom right, there's a little blue color. That's where the melting water enters the sea. It's got a little channel there. We were very lucky with the weather. Pretty nice clouds, made a nice background. When you're taking pictures of icebergs, um, it's not good to have direct sunlight. It's too contrasty. Although we're quite far south, so the sun is never very high in the sky. But an overcast or semi-overcast sky is really good. 
also, there's a lot of white here, so keep an eye on your histogram that you don't blow out your white. You, you still want it towards the white area in the histogram, but don't blow it out. The zodiac for scale to show you how large the icebergs are. And I showed this also in competition, um, a, a hole through one of the icebergs and a zodiac from our ship on the other side. Now this is a little deceptive going from that picture to this. The smooth area is actually in the foreground and the rough area in the background. You get all kinds of shapes of the iceberg. Some are smooth, some are rough, some are toadstool shape, just wonderful. Okay, so now we're going to Antarctica itself. We'll land on Devil's Island and then go down on the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula. So as we we're cruising along, I found this spot on the ship with a bunch of mirrors. This isn't a trick done in Photoshop. All these mirrors are in, on an arc of a circle. And if you stand at the center of the circle, then you, you will be reflected in each of these mirrors. And that's how I did the picture. Self portrait. So we're finally at the seventh continent. And that morning it snowed a little bit. And uh, it was windy, but not that cold. But as I said, quite windy. So we went to shore, colony of Adeli penguins. You can see some of them uh, along the shore on the left side of the picture. The colony itself is up in the rocks on the right side. We, we were confined. We couldn't go on the shore where the penguins were marching. This is the penguin colony up on the shore. And along, sorry, up on the rocks, along the shore were these big chunks of ice, sculpted ice, um, beautiful pieces of ice, and the penguins marching by. Another ice sculpture with penguins marching by and icebergs offshore. So um, occasionally we'd get very strong gusts coming from up high, and it just blew the snow into the air and reduced the vis visibility a lot. You can see birds on the left, and they're very, very close to the people. They didn't care that we were there. Back on the ship, traveling south, the weather got very nice. This is towards evening. And some birds flew by. These are southern fulmars. Again, uh, these are birds that stay at sea and have to drink seawater. Uh, <clears throat> Big ship went by an iceberg with a couple of penguins and a couple other types of birds. And this shows how, how small our ship is, 400 feet long. On this day, we went out in the Zodiacs first and then went to land afterwards. We're cruising around. Uh, the seas are very, very calm, almost no wind. And there were whales, two whales. Uh, these are humpback whales. The humpback whale, when he shows this much back, he's going to go deep and the tail is going to come out of, all the way out of the water. And that's what happened here. So we're in the zodiac here. These whales are much, much bigger than the zodiacs, but um, never had any problems. And we looked south and there was this cloud of snow. And I thought, what's happened? And this is an avalanche, so snow avalanche, and a lot of loose snow has been driven into the air. Fortunately, nobody in the Zodiacs or in the kayaks were underneath there, so no problems. So the goal here was to come to shore, walk up the zigzag here to a penguin, penguin colony, sinstrap penguin colony up in the rocks at the top. It was quite a hike for me to the top, but I made it. And this is the view looking from the top away from where the main ship was. And this is part of the peng penguin colony, but the seventh kind of penguin, the chin strap penguin. So as I had mentioned, the penguins eat krill. The krill are kind of shrimp like creatures and they're kind of pink. And when the penguins poop, 
they squirt out this pink goo, and that's what's on the back of this penguin. So these penguins are all the way at the top here. They have to march all the way down. I don't know which side. Uh, go in the water, find krill, you know, eat the krill, bring, bring the krill up to feed the chicks. It's a long round trip. Here's a close-up of one of the chinstrap penguins. And this is part of the penguin colony. A couple of young chicks here. They're very close together almost. It seems to me like they probably had two eggs. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. And you see the ground is, is very pinkish from the penguin poop. Now looking down towards where we came up, the small, the small uh, kayaks, yeah. Kayaks got to go out. Back on the ship, uh, came past this uh, iceberg. You can see most of it's underwater here. Nice blue color, nice shapes. So we're traveling along these mountains. Um, yeah, this is Antarctica now. We finally found another ship. Uh, this is run by the same company that our, troop, our tour was. And the small ship is either a private ship or a very small tour. I don't know which. Now we found this uh, sailing vessel, just beautiful. And I waited till the tops of the mast were um, behind that curve, the ice in the background. This is a research station. Uh, this is called Lockroy. And people stay there all summer long. There are no shower facilities at the research station. So when the cruise ships come in, these young people are taken to the cruise ship so they can get a shower. And you can uh, send postcards from here. And they'll stamp them with the Lockroy postage mark. And the next cruise ship comes. And eventually, that goes to the Falkland Islands and has flown to London. And then the postcard enters the usual postal system. We sent one to ourselves and it came probably a month or two after we got home. <laughs> so we're on shore here. It's a mountain range here. The biggest mountain is Snow White. And the seven peaks there are the seven dwarfs. And I took this with my cell phone. So with telephoto lens, this is a, a Gen 2 penguin looking at me. Uh, nice background, not distracting. Both up picture of a Gen 2 penguin. And three, three Gen 2 penguins having a conversation or, or a gossip or maybe being aggressive. And when the penguins poop, it just squirt, squirts out. And again, the red color, pink color from the krill. So we went out uh, cruising in the Zodiacs and our driver had studied whales. So he was able to get very close without spooking the whales. Uh, you can see on the right side in the air is, is the spray from this uh, whale. And this whale was coming towards us and made a deep dive. And I got this as he's going down. There was some snow in the background at the edge of the water, and I, I removed that. Uh, didn't crop much from the side. We were actually pretty close. So this picture, I thought the background added a lot, and I kept the whale dark. So contrast here. So that was really fun. We had a couple of whales that came very, very close to the bow of our zodiac. They just went on cruising by, no problem. This is again a Back on the ship, um, the computer screen showing our position. We've come down. The red line is where we've been. Came down through a very narrow channel, and the ship is positioned at, at Port, Port Lockroy. Lots of islands around there. So we've left Port, Port Lockroy, and we're heading towards the Lamar Channel, which is a very narrow channel. Uh, late in the, well, in the evening, it's probably 10 o'clock at night. 
but we're fairly far south, so the sun doesn't set for uh, until pretty late. We found this pattern of uh, grooves in the ice. This was the only place we saw this, and you don't know what the origin of this is. It's either melting water causing these grooves or rocks sliding down and cutting these grooves. I don't know which. Uh, these, these lines here are made by the penguins as they come out of the water, they come up on the rock, and then they, they make a penguin highway. The upper the area in the upper right is the penguin colony, and that's where the penguins go in the water. There also there's a penguin colony up above these rocks. You can see two lines leading up there, also a line coming in from the right. But we're now entering the Lamar Channel. You can see a small ship coming towards us, very new, narrow channel before us. And this was another place where we saw another ship. This is a Norwegian ship, much larger than ours. Um, this place, we came to this place because if you paid extra and you wanted to camp on the ice, you could do it here. The Norwegian ship, People could also do it, and they had red tents. People from our ship only have a, had a bivy bag, which is a plastic bag, and you put your sleeping bag into that, and that's how you're supposed to sleep. And it rained a bit during the night. The next day, well, Gail and I didn't do this. We'd camped in the dark, in the in the cold before, and didn't see any point in paying money to to camp and be cold. So the next day we asked the young people, well, how was it? And they said, oh, it was great. And we asked the older people, kind of in my age, and asked them, how was it? And they said, it wasn't much fun. Yeah, and there was one fellow from the crew who I think he had to stay awake all night and he was in bad shape the next day. So we're, we're traveling again on the ship. And this, this iceberg was, small iceberg was very close to the ship. And you can see through the water and see that 90% of the ice is underwater, 10% above. So you're probably wondering, well, what does our cabin look like? This is our cabin, uh, two, two photos, uh, prints on the wall, queen size bed, good size window to look out. And then taking a picture from the corner that's in, almost in the middle. This is looking in the other direction, Gail sitting there above her life jackets. And we had a, a bathroom as well, toilet sink and shower. The shower is small, it's adequate, but when, you're, when the waves are making the ship rock back and forth, it's a little hard to if you want to wash the bottom of your foot, it's not the most convenient. So you have to be very careful. So anyway, that's what our cabin was like. This is the dining room. All 165 people could have a meal here at the same time. So bre breakfast and lunch were, you go to the counter and get your food and dinner was a served, served dinner. They brought you dinner you had your, your choice of three item, items for appetizers, main, main course, and dessert. Good, pretty good food. Uh, this is the upper lounge on the seventh floor, which is as high as it went. Uh, there was also a, a lounge on the fifth floor where they gave lectures. And if we were underway, uh, lectures at least twice a day, and in the evening, every evening we'd have a kind of a meeting to summarize what happened that day and to let us know what was going to happen the next day. Okay, so this uh, tour was to cross the Antarctic Circle. That was one of the things that was advertised. So at number 19 on this map, we crossed the Arctic Circle, stopped at an island at number 20. And when we were at number 20 overnight, um, we had our review session and they said, well, the weather to the north of us is really bad, but to the weather to the south, it's really good. So we're gonna keep on going south. 
So we went um, the pathway to number 21, which is Horseshoe Island. So we cruise all night long and the next morning we're near the shore. You can see the icebergs, not icebergs, glaciers, mountains, um, lots of blue sky, uh, clouds starting to form on the left, uh, sorry, on the right side. And a little further on towards the right, uh, more clouds forming, but it was really spectacular. The sun shining through, beautiful clouds. As we got further along, a, a big island ahead of us with clouds forming above it, icebergs on the right side, and in the background, mountains of Antarctica proper. And as we got closer to this island, more clouds had formed. I thought this was one terrific island. So we're uh, going up this channel and we're gonna stop at that island. But meanwhile, we were promised if you wanted to, you could do a polar plunge. <laughs> so now the, the water temperature is probably about 32 degrees. Now salt water doesn't freeze at 32 degrees, so it can be that cold. So I have a sequence. She was the first person to jump. Now she's got two ropes attached to her. There's a doctor standing by, and there's and there's a zodiac ready to rush to her to rush to her aid if necessary. She went all the way under. Now the crazy the crazy thing is, I went back in into the ship, and there's a whole long line of people waiting to do this, and they've they've got their bathrobes on waiting. And it turned out 90 people jumped in the water. Some of these may have been crew members, but most of them were probably paying passengers. I didn't see any point in doing that. Uh, no, Gail didn't do it either. So we, afterwards, we went to this island and we did a Zodiac cruise, beautiful icebergs. And this lady had goggles on and somebody, and the Zodiac said, oh, look at the reflection. And we asked her if we could take pictures. So this is the Zodiac and people reflected in the goggles. So they were wonderful icebergs. And I had a telephoto along. So I took this picture with my uh, cell phone. And this iceberg has a, a straight blue line through it. Doesn't look straight, but if you have the right angle, it is. How this blue color happened, I don't know, but I thought it was quite interesting. Here the water turn is green, maybe because these icebergs are in shallow water, maybe sand, I don't know why. So you're wondering why the diagonal lines, it, it makes for a good picture. <clears throat> as icebergs are in the water, well, as they float along, they melt underneath. Eventually, the center of gravity changes. And if it changes just the right amount, then the iceberg will roll. And that's what happened here. It rolled once. And one of these diagonal lines was the shore, was kind of like the shoreline where the waves were coming up against it. Then it rolled again. And the other side was at the water level. Um, the grooves in the iceberg on the upper left side, they tell me that happens when the water, or the ice melts and water runs down, and the water running down eventually makes these grooves. So another picture I showed at competition, uh, another spectacular iceberg or a detail of one. But we were on shore, and um, this is a, a detail of a rock, maybe a foot or two across. Uh, the rock is cracked, forming patterns, and chemicals have leached out, forming the, these green lines. It was only on this island that we saw these this green material. Uh, the chemistry of, of rocks is pretty complex, and I don't know what it is. And so I have no idea why the green color. Okay, so we were at the southernmost point. And it was time to head north. 
And we stopped at uh, Deception Island, uh, Caldera, went to uh, Colony uh, number 23, and it was time to head for Ushuaia to cross the Drake Passage. And the Drake Passage is notorious for terrible weather and huge waves. And sometimes it's called the, the dreaded Drake, and sometimes it's the Drake Lake. Well, it turns out it was the Drake Lake. We're now all the way across the Drake Passage, and most of the time we didn't even have white caps. We're now entering or close to entering the Beagle Channel, and this is a view off the stern of our ship. Um, some clouds a little further on. We had sunny weather, and this porpoise jumped all the way out of the water. This is a peelless porpoise. A uh, long, long ways away, shot with a telephoto and dropped a lot. It was way out there. Then the weather started turning not so good. Wind started picking up, looked like rain clouds ahead of us. We went through a rainstorm, heavy, heavy winds, and we came back to Ushuaia. Uh, docked here, this is the end of the trip. Then we flew home. And this is the last picture. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to take questions. This was, the trip was, the expedition was not a polar break. Right? Correct, a yeah. Break. Yeah, it was just, uh, anybody can go on this tour and there are plenty of opportunities to take pictures. You said there were lectures, did they have a naturalist or an ornithologist? Yeah. Yeah, so they had an ornithologist, uh, a geologist, historian, 24 expedition experts. All of them had, had been trained to run these zodiacs, and they all had, they all gave lectures, marine life, uh, you name it, they talked about it. So very interesting. Never a dull moment. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, really. Yeah, that is really a clear. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you have enough for life. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of camera were you shooting? Using a Nikon D500. Yeah. And I had long. Um, so I had a about a 24 millimeter lens. So we took a wide angle. We took a macro lens from around the 60 millimeter, but they said we couldn't nail down. So, so I didn't take any macro pictures on it. Or for the mid range, I have a 24 to 120. And then for telephoto, I had a 70 to 300. And it's a crop sensor to all the focal links, multiplied at 1.5 to get the. 35 on the equip, right? Yeah. yeah. Were, were most of the passengers, uh, your fellow passengers, Americans or Europeans, or where were they from? They were from all over the world China, Japan, Australia, US. Um, all over. I imagine everybody was taking pictures. Yeah. Was there a cell phone service uh, on the islands and in Antarctica? Yeah, if you pay extra, you could have cell phone service. Uh -huh. um, if you had um, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. that was free. Yeah, so that worked on the internet. Yeah. yeah, on the ship. Yeah. On the ship. Yeah. And we had that everywhere. The ship was using some sort of satellite technology to connect yeah. the internet. Yeah. 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 So we were really remote. But you still have good have communication. Yeah, we elected not to do the cell phone for the yeah. 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 Can I add that the, the rocks the department of Comorettes, shag rocks I guess. Yeah. Are those volcanic? No, I think um so the Falkland Islands were rocks. South Georgia Island. The 
Well, the continental drift never right. knows about that. So it was South America, Antarctica, Africa were all together. This all pulled apart. And the Falkland Islands, I think all these three pieces were pieces that ripped apart the scraps and were then left by themselves. Okay. One more I read that Falkland Islands actually did a 180 degree turn. Mm -hmm. um, from its original position to the final position now. There's, um, there, there are plates that want to you know, do this kind of horseshoe uh, in that, in the great Mexico area in the east. And then further east, there's some islands, and those are all volcanic islands. But um, as I mentioned, we did go to a caldera which was, of course, volcanic, but most of it is not volcanic. And were you able to see, um, you know, the what they'll see? The Waddell Sea is, we saw Lake Earth, we saw icebergs coming up from the Waddell Sea, mm -hmm. but we didn't see the, the edge of the ice there. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. The ice is melting in Antarctica, mm -hmm. and the the uh, sea ice coverage is getting less and less every winter, just like in the north. There's a fear that the Ross Ice Shed Sea is going to go loose, right. which yeah. is what about the size of almost the size of Australia? Yeah. yeah so if the ice breaks, Ross Ross Ice Shelf breaks yeah. loose, that's a big problem. Yeah, real big. Um, so sea level is going to keep coming up. I think it's floating anyway. So yeah. Well, but the yeah, yeah. shelf is floating. Yeah. So that doesn't affect sea level. But the glaciers will. And so as as the ice shelf comes away from the from the rock area, and the glaciers, the ice in the glacier is now free to move down into the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And it will be more. the the ice sheet, the ice shelf. Keeps it cool. And it goes right. away then or cool. Yeah. So are there are there questions from people at home? Oz, I'm a little disappointed that you did not go in the water. <laughs> I felt the same way. Exactly. Yeah. Todd. And I would have paid a lot of money if somebody had gotten a picture of Oz in uh, yeah, smarter, I smarter than the average bear. <laughs> he but says. I said, there's 90 people. I just didn't see the point in it. <laughs> hey, Ron Cooper. Hey, Todd. Wow. It's a good turn, a good looking group. Well, yeah, nine out of 11. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> You're always so kind, Todd. You're always so kind. I know. I put this pull <laughs> pulling, pulling legs. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for all your hard work and um, your diligent effort to get there, Oz. That was uh, a story really in of itself. You got some competition airports, stand, um, photos standing around airports, as I recall. And uh, well, maybe that was with um, uh, Gary. That might have been with Gary Witt. So anyway. Well, um, thank you for taking the time to do that. That was really, uh, really impressive. I'm glad, glad to see my pictures and adventure. Any more questions or comments? Great. I'm adding it to my list. I'm adding it to the Oh, my yeah. <laughs> Everybody should go. Yeah, I think you just made a lot of people envious and, and jealous. And now a few of us are going to have to uh, save up with bunch of money and go plan a trip. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you uh, sharing your trip with us, sharing those wonderful images. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, this slightly longer than normal program. Yeah, I think it would be a bit worth it. Thank you, Oz, for pulling it together. Thank you, Thank you.
Okay, if we have nothing else, then uh, we'll bid a fond farewell to everyone. And uh, we'll see you in, in a couple of weeks for the competition. Thank you all. all. Thanks for joining us. How long's your uh, How long is your residency? Four years, so I will be here at the minimum <laughs> four years. <laughs> what, what is your residency in? I'm doing psychiatry at the University of Colorado. Oh, uh, you can get some. You can get some uh, volunteers from this group. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's actually half the reason I joined. I'm trying to build my private practice for the future. <laughs> <laughs> You got the right group. <laughs> all right. Well, don't tell all our secrets yet, Todd. No, no, I, you got to get him. You got to get his money and get him a camera. There yes, you go. please. If you have any recommendations or tips, please, I would rec. I would appreciate any and all help. Yeah, well, um, Arjun, I'm not sure where you're living in the Denver area, but if, uh, if you can make it down to Lone Tree for a meeting or two, then uh, you get to talk to people in person and uh, I'm sure there'll be a couple people who'd be more than happy to help you out. Yeah, I hopefully make it to the next one. I live out in uh, Cherry Creek. Um, you know, close to the town, but yeah. we try to make it. Right. Take care. Very good. All right. Well, again, thank you all and uh, see you at the next meeting. Good night.